what's called compassionate inquiry work, which is what um, I studied through De Gabor Mate. And that is the foundation of all the coaching work. So essentially I do life coaching with people um, and, I, and I specialize in working with like trauma, addiction, um, things like that. Um, but I also am a fitness coach as well. So I do fitness training and things like that and hands-on manual uh, okay, that's a, work. Well, we can I know, it's a lot. We can, well, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, yeah. And let's just just begin, and we'll probably just use your what you just said as your intro because that's a <laughs> that's more than I can remember right now. But uh, welcome to Breath with Friends, uh, Tristan Saint Germain. Uh, we are on the air; it's happening right now. <laughs> just, uh, awesome. Forgive me if I have to ask you a couple times because now the rain's really um, coming in, and it comes. You know, we have a we have a saying in Oregon: if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Because it, okay, changes, it like, comes and goes. <laughs> like, um, so um, I originally met you, I do believe, uh, in the Burning Man days and possibly yeah. Moon Tribe, maybe Moon Tribe. No, I think pre Burning Man, I would say Moon Tribe, Venice Beach, LA. I think where really all started to unwind for me, and I'll explain what I either mean by that, was you know, really at that time, you know, in the, in the late 90s, I had arrived to. Venice Beach from New York, Vermont. Um, I was young, 21, definitely doing a lot of modeling back then. Um, I was uh, doing competitive snowboarding until I had fractured my back. And that was like my greatest passion. Like I was like gung ho doing it all the time, um, surfing, snowboarding, you know, rollerblading, half pipes, things like that. And then after that injury, that really just kind of changed my perspective on what I was doing. I was like, do I even really care about competition? Like, I guess I really don't because I just like to snowboard and I don't actually want to hurt myself. You know, I don't want to not be able to walk. That was really scary because I fractured my iliac crest, which is the upper hip. And I couldn't walk for weeks and I had to take the rest of the year off. And that just, you know, that was humbling. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, like I don't really want to break myself and you have to go big, you know, to, to win. Right. And I was like, I actually don't care about competition. I was never into sports or competitive anything. So I realized I was like, um, that really wasn't even my drive. And so, you know, at that time I had landed in LA and I found the whole underground dance culture, right? Like moon tribes and all, all the outdoor gatherings and the whole underground scene. And at the same time was, you know, taking psychedelics and going to these events. And, and at first, like I didn't dance like at all. Like I was frozen, like totally inhibited, just like uh, super self-conscious and, I was fascinated though by what I witnessed because I saw this like freedom in people, the way that they moved and expressed themselves and, and, and the kindness that was really in that scene. Like it was just nothing I'd ever experienced before. You know, I was like, wow, like these people are so free. Like I just didn't even think I could be that way, but I just wanted to be, I was fa completely fascinated. Like how bizarre the fashions were, like people just wore whatever they wanted. Um, everyone was hugging and getting along and people were just dancing in all kinds of crazy ways. It wasn't like, um, there was like, you know, you were a trained dancer. It was just like, it was this freedom I saw in people that like, it was amazing. And this lack of judgment that I was just completely intrigued by and through taking psychedelics and kind of being an observer at those first early, you know, events I'd went to, I started to see the inner working of my own, um, self-consciousness and all these ways I just super judged myself you know and like carried all of this these belief systems really limiting beliefs about you know myself and like who I am you know and how it what's okay for me how it's so appropriate or okay to move how it's okay or appropriate to dress and express myself and I just was witnessing and understanding I was like wow like I have all these layers like I really don't want to have these I feel like I'm in a prison inside my mind you know and I started so, you know, work with the help of particularly MDMA in particular, that was like huge, just kept opening my heart. And the more I went towards it, and the more I started developing this self acceptance is what it was. And I started to slowly let myself move. I mean, it took a good six months of like, kind of standing around and watching and like wanting so bad to be free enough to like feel okay to move. But I was literally frozen, like physically frozen, like in my really in my trauma, but I didn't even know that was a word. Then that still took quite a few years before I knew what that word even meant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but once I started unwinding, I, something happened, you know, it was like, it was the most profound magical experience of my life. Like the more I started allowing myself to give myself permission to 
one, just start to explore and uh, fashion, you know, in a way that was like, what, well, who even am I? How do I want to dress? Like, what do I, what do I, how do I want to adorn myself? You know, like, this is my vessel. You know, what feels, what feels like me? What even is me? Because I was just kind of stuck in, in what culture, you know, what was popular or, or not popular for that matter. I kind of leaned into the grunge, not popular, or, but, which was totally popular. And, uh, but I just started kind of breaking out of that and like allowing myself more freedom and the more freedom and the more movement, I started having these like moments on the dance floor that were like transcendental, like the most spiritual experience I'd ever had. And I'm, and I was never religious. Um, I wasn't even really spiritual. You know, the only thing that was, I guess, spiritual was like my connection to nature. And that's part of why I like being on the mountain and snowboarding. But even that was like, uh, you know, that's where I was noticing I was finding comfort and peace because I felt like I didn't fit in growing up. I felt very like an alien. I felt like people didn't really see me or understand me. I felt very isolated. Even though I had friends, I just felt like they didn't, most of them, not all of them, but most of them really didn't even know me, you know? And, and truthfully, like, I don't even know if I knew me. You know, it was like uh, kind of a, a very isolating experience as a child. And um, so coming into these events and people are just embracing me and, you know, really wanting to um, and just loving me up. And like the more I was loving myself up, the more that I was that was reflecting from the outside world, you know, and I was just having this experience. So that started unfolding over time. Um, and at the same time, like simultaneously, that was like in the late 90s, I'd say like around 97, 98, I had met this, this woman. And she was like the first empowered, embodied, divine, feminine goddess woman that I'd ever met. And she was uh, about, you know, 15, 16 years older than me. And she used to just like, I got in her presence. And it was like, I'd never had an experience like this, where I just started crying, like something about her just opened something up inside of me. And um, she was so compassionate and kind and she was a healer and did body work and stuff. And she was deep into psychedelic, but in a way that was, um, more ceremony, right. Which I had never even heard the concept ceremony or, you know, under some of that meant, but she was doing a lot of work, um, in like Stan Groff's method of working with like LSD in isolation, sensory deprivation, um, and as well as like other ceremonial things, like working with DMT and ayahuasca and mushrooms and things, but never like out at parties and stuff for her was like this healing ceremonial experience. And so that was like a completely new concept to me. And so she invited me to come and to experience that. And that was the first time that, you know, when I put the blindfold and headphones on and took that LSD, um, it was the first time I ever went inward, like just without anything from the external reality of the space that I was in affecting my experience. But instead it was about me going in and doing like this deeper introspective work. And that just opened up my perceptions to like what's possible with psychedelics. Again, I was young and I think I was about 21 at that time. And, uh, you know, I didn't really have a lot of outlets of um, healing at the time. You know, this was just the beginning of it. So it's like all at once, this whole thing started exploding between like dance and self acceptance and then stepping into like psychedelics in a way that was internalized and at the same time finding yoga and, and massage. And all of a sudden, I'm getting surrounded by all these like you know, people that do body work and stuff and physical touch. And it really just started inspiring me, you know, the whole idea of like healing that there's even anything to heal, right? Because like, when we grow up, I think life is just what it is. And at least for me, you know, in the 70s, 80s, into the early 90s, like, we didn't have computers, you know, or, or maybe we had some really basic, but we didn't have internet, you know, there was no access to what's going on in the greater world, there wasn't a lot of the sharing of information. And so, you know, I just, whatever I experienced in my life was just how life was. It was what was normal, right? There was no thought about like trauma or that like experience that happened to me were traumatizing. Like I wasn't even, you know, there was no conversation about that until I had moved to California and kind of like dropped into this whole scene, you know? And that was like just little by little, like all these internal doors in my perception started opening up and, and like kind of unwinding, you know, my, myself and starting to notice and becoming more curious about like, my belief. Uh, why do I think the way that I think? Like, why do I react the way I react? And, um, you know, little by little, that started to just be really inspiring to me, like the whole path inward is what really was inspiring. Because I was like, wow, this is a whole vast, infinite exploration. And it doesn't seem like there's any end. Um, and, you know, simultaneously, like, while all this is happening, you know, I was going through my life experiences and some heartbreaks and just some pretty devastating 
experiences that uh, put me into like a really like dark place, you could say, like, I really went through the dark night of the soul. And I went through like a good, probably solid nine, 10 months of hardcore drug use. And the guy just what kind of drugs were those that the, the uh, hardcore mostly crack cocaine. Oh, wow. But I but I also would do like smoke heroin to come down, um, you know, sometimes. And we know was this, you know, was, was this I'm sorry to interject, uh, but it's uh -huh. uh, I'm curious. Was that before or after the MDMA mushroom experiences and stuff like that? Which one? That was actually, uh, well, interestingly enough, it's the first drug I ever tried when I was 16, 15 in New York. Um, growing up, someone put it in my cigarette. I didn't even know what it was. And I, the second I tried it, it was this like majorly euphoric experience and it instantly got its hooks in me, but I didn't have access to it. I didn't even know what it was until like a year later, but like every once in a while, this older friend would come around and like, you know, put it in my cigarette. And then when I figured out what it was, I was like, kind of embarrassed. I was like, oh, I know you're not supposed to do that. You know, like <laughs> snorting cocaine lines was like common, you know, that was like acceptable on the East coast at that time. And I didn't do that you know, that much, but if it was around, I was going to do it. You know, it just seemed like um, a thing that people did. I really didn't know. Uh, and so again, like it got its hooks in me, but uh, I didn't have a lot of access, you know, and it was, it came through in like two waves in my life where once when I was 19, um, after I broke my back, I ended up in a relationship with somebody that was taking care of me who had a severe problem with it. And I, and, and he was making it himself, cooking himself. And um, started getting me like really high. It was the first time I'd ever actually had like a, a lot of it. Like it was always just like a little tiny bit. And it was like just this most euphoric experience. And what I didn't realize was like, why was I wanting that euphoric experience? This didn't come around until later when I went through like that, that second wave of it. But that lasted for a good year and a half going through these waves with this guy where it was like, I was sort of stuck in this relationship pattern with this person, you know, codependent, um, unhealthy patterns and you know, he would just bring it around. And I'd be like, please don't bring that anymore. And then he'd be like, okay. And then like a month later, he'd bring it around again. And so it's like, not like it was all the time I was a functioning addict, but I was definitely addicted. Like if it was there, there was no saying no, I had no self-control. It was like, it ran me. And uh, again, I didn't even question that, what that was. I just, it was like, it would just took over when it was around. Now, fast forward a couple of years, like I went through some periods of like not using it, it just wasn't around. And then this time at about 22, 23, when I went through this like pretty hardcore back-to-back -back heartbreak stuff, um, I met the wrong person who, who just had an endless supply and invited me in. And I kind of went on this journey and I decided, I was like, you know what? I don't even know if I want to be here anymore. Like I was so depressed and um that I just wanted that escape. I wanted to feel that euphoria. And so I just would, you know, go and do, go onto these weekend warrior missions. And, but what happened was, is like, it just started to get worse. Meaning like sometimes we would go for days and days and days. And I was shriveling up to like, I mean, I was like 105 pounds by the time I um, almost died basically. Oh. And so that's pretty much what happened that, and, you know, I, I, I was like noticing, I was like, I need to stop doing this. And I can't, like, I found myself in like, Kind of the bowels of my own hell like where i was like i don't actually know how to stop i'm not in the driver's seat like i really don't know how to and and but i wasn't making any effort yet and it wasn't until i had gone on you know i was on a long five days or maybe six days bend bender with these people that i was hanging out with and and again like at that at this point that's when we were like you know smoking crack and then like we would do heroin to come down and it was a whole fucking thing were you shooting and, the heroin were you shooting it no or no, just smoking it. And we, uh, I, I guess apparently I had gone down to the, into the condo pool with a couple of these people, this couple that I was with. And I don't remember any of this, but apparently I went face down in the pool and I was a floater. Like I just went completely unconscious and um, they quickly, because they didn't want the police to get called or anything, they fished me out of the water, brought me upstairs and uh, left me up there. Now I didn't wake up for 72 hours. When I woke up, I was, it was a complete blur and a blackout. And there was a note telling me what happened. And I was like, completely, that woke me up. It was like, I was like, oh my God, you people, number one, are not my friends. You didn't even call the hospital. Like, what if I was dead? Was I in a coma? Like, did I overdose? Like, what the hell happened to me? I had no idea. And so that was the moment. That was it right there. It was like, okay, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Like, do you want, why are you doing this? Do you want to live or die? And I was like, I really don't want to actually die. I'm just in so much pain. 
I don't know how to be in the, in the pain. I want the pain to go away and I want to feel good. I want to feel healthy. And so I called two friends and I told them what happened that didn't know because I was very secretive about what I was doing. I maintained a double life. Like when I wasn't doing this, I was going to yoga class. Okay. So like I maintained a secret double life because I was ashamed about this behavior. And I called them. I just needed accountability buddies. I was like, I need you guys to know this is what's going on. And I need to not do this anymore because I'm going to kill myself. Like I'm going to die. And they were like, okay, we got you. Like, and that was the beginning of me realizing I was like, all right, I'm not an NA girl. Like going to a, a meeting is not, I'm not going to not do this because of anything outside myself has to come from within because I'm just, my will is so strong. Like I just knew that about myself. And I, this is when I went into like shamanic mode. I was like, I am going to exercise this demon out of me. That's it. And that's what it felt like. I felt like I had the grips of like some kind of energetic being that would like literally take over the front seat of my consciousness. And I would all of a sudden be in the back seat, like witnessing myself do these things and go on these journeys and like do all these drugs. And I had zero control over that. And I said, you know, I actually want to be in control of this vessel. This is my vessel. Like, you know, Tristan, this, this personality or whatever that's inhabiting this body, whatever this thing is, that's attached to this drug, like it's got to go. And that's why I started looking at it as like that, you know, this entity coming from this drug. And so little by little, I just started to um, do this deep work. And I, I didn't know even the concept of the word shaman or, he, you know, any of that kind of stuff at the time. It was just like, I was just getting self-directed, you know, at that point, it was just like something inside of me you know, I started praying and again, like not in a religious way, but just like praying to whatever, anything that's listening, like any kind of spirit guides, ancestors, allies, like help me to purge this, you know, clear this out of my system. And so um, that became my journey, you know, and then that whole next year was just like me just completely transforming, you know, my reality, getting rid of all the people that were associated with that drug and just clearing them out and um, you know, just getting super healthy, like just like next level, you know, leveling up. And, and it was a process. And I realized, I was sort of realizing, I was like, oh, there's, there's a, why was I doing that? You know, like, why did I get sucked into that? And that's when it started to dawn. I mean, this is where I started to learn about, um, you know, trauma, like what that even is, you know, that there's something going on that I had some pain. And at the time, I really associated it with these heartbreaks, right? Like, oh, I just like gave, 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 and was left completely empty. And, I had nothing left. I didn't even have enough energy to like live my life, right? So that's what I associated it with at the time. It wasn't until a number of years later into sobriety um, that I realized that, no, this goes, way, this goes way back, way back, you know, into early childhood. And, you know, that's really what was going on is I was looking for an escape because I was anxious. You know, that I had this anxious buzz going on for so long, underlying just being existing that for me, that escape was like pure pleasure instead of the anxiety. And, you know, while my parents did the best job that they could, um, my household was highly stressful. Like they yelled and screamed and there was a lot of fighting going on pretty much every day. You know, on the regular, it was high intensity. And as a child growing up in that environment for 18 years, like it really affected my psychology. And, um, you know, that it was, it was, I, again, like I wanted to escape all of that and go into, something that felt pleasurable, right? Because that was not pleasurable. It was actually really st high stress. Um, and so, you know, at that time, like right after I got sober, right? Like completely sober, I was like, no more hard drugs ever again. Like I'm never fucking doing that. Now I had good experiences again with psychedelics and cannabis and things. I was never a big drinker, but like, I like the other things. So it wasn't like black or white, like, oh, I'm sober. I do not, I'm not gonna touch anything ever again. I was like, no, actually I found benefit from working with psychedelics okay, recognizing that, I was like, okay, I'll keep that door open. That's great. The other door, hard drugs, uh -uh, completely done. They do no nothing to harm me. And I realized that. And I was like, they're an escape band-aid for something that's going on that's like painful for me. And so I closed that door and that was over 20 years ago at this point. Um, and so simul <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> at that time that I had closed that door and I came through like a year out of it is when I manifested my life partner, right? Like who's fucking amazing and I'm married to enough two kids, Matthew. Um, healthy relationships, like new friends that were like still in my life today. Um, and I started getting into healing arts. I was like, I, I, I started going towards healing arts for my own healing, you know? And I had no, I had taken note that like when I was getting high, like one of the things I was like, really like to do is actually like, and I didn't know what it was, but like cranial sacral work, like working in the cranium, 
all, yeah, all, I wasn't going in people's mouths quite yet at that time, but um, <laughs> it was just, I wasn't trained. I, I didn't know what it was, but everybody would always ask me to like work on their head and neck. And like, I was pretty much doing like Reiki and craniosacral work completely untrained, you know, at that, you know, young time getting high on psychedelics. And I realized I had some sort of pe- because of the response I was getting the feedback, there was obviously a natural gift there, right? I was like, okay, I'm good at this. Like, I can feel I'm good at this. The response is positive. So I'm going to go to school. And that started a couple years of me going to different schools for shiatsu, Swedish massage, um, learning about acupressure, learning about energy, like continuing to evolve over those next couple of years, taking all these classes and stepping into the healing arts. And of course, whenever you go into any kind of program, um, you know, it requires you to turn your focus inward and to look deeper at your own self and your own healings. And so not only were we learning how to like learn about anatomy and, you know, how to touch, but also it was an opportunity to be touched a lot and to receive healing. And so that was a really beautiful experience. And that kind of started the ball of me stepping into the healing art. Um, and that was in 2003, two, two, three, I believe. Yeah, that I started doing that. And I did that for a while until um, I got pregnant and I was like getting too big to get around the table. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we're gonna put this on the side for a little while and go into mom mode. And um, now also, at that time, I was already performing and dancing, you know, so again, like I could let's backtrack, like I started dancing in 1997, like late 97. By 2002, I was getting asking people to at people were asking me if I would perform. And I'm like, that's really weird, because I've never done any training. But what it was, was like, I realized, and you know, in hindsight, what it was, was like, I didn't have any training, but like my freestyle, my ability to just like, um, move without uh, being so inhibited, you know, what that, that freestyle was what was attractive, right? It wasn't that it was so structured, I was the best dancer or anything. It was just that there was, they could feel that passion, I think. And I started working with all the flow arts toys, right? So to me, like working with the staff and poi and hula hoops was like this great way to train my left brain, right brain and become ambidextrous. And that eventually turned to fire, right? This is all, you know, again, like around 2001 is when I started spitting fire and all of a sudden people were wanting to pay me to come to their parties and like dance. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that's cool. All right. And I'm making all these costumes and stuff. And so, you know, that thing started to evolve simultaneously. Um, and then I, once the baby was born, Kainoa, we moved to Northern California. And, um, you know, I spent the next couple of years, next five years, like living off the grid and just, you know, being like out in the woods and had another child and was doing all that. And I wasn't doing body work, um, but I was the front seat, um, all the performance stuff took the front seat. And it was like an amazing troupe of women and men that I got involved with dancing and performing up based out of Northern California. And we were, you know, performing at festivals and stuff. And that was amazing. And as well, um, I got invited to become part of like a, well, actually to come to Indonesia and do fashion because I was already hand making a lot of costumes. And so I ended up taking off to Indonesia, starting a clothing line. And like that went on for, you know, almost a decade. (laughs) Right. And so now that's like, let's say 2005 until about 2011, right? That, so like I was already like making clothes from, you know, 2000 until 2011, a lot of handmade stuff that was always happening. And then like when the fashion thing happened, that was like full, a full-time, you know, job. And around 2011 um, is when ayahuasca started coming into my life. Okay. And that was a, a mutual, a, yeah, a mutual, a friend of mine who I danced with professionally, like we did shows and stuff like that down in Los Angeles had found her way into the jungle and um, helped to open up a center, healing center down in Peru with her partner. And it was, um, you know, run by Shipibo and Shipiba healers, um, uh, mostly female, female to male ratio. And uh, eventually, you know, I started working with that medicine. She started bringing that medicine here. And eventually I went down there and like that journey continued and still obviously a huge part of my life today. What started happening with that was like, that was like really my first introduction into like ceremony with a group, right? Because I had done those early experiences like in self-isolation, but this was different. Like this was like, you know, ayahuasca is a whole nother experience. You know, really they, they say like, you know, that there's, it goes into the shadow work. Well, it was really the thing that really 
made me see the into again that like the belly of the whale like whoa like it really it was it took me on these journeys where I was able to completely see like the entire trajectory of not only my life and my personal experiences and these like traumas and things I had buried like buried deep you know all kinds of fit stories that, that unfolded um but also like in the collective consciousness you know like I would have these you know visions and experiences of like the most horrific atrocities that have happened to human beings on this planet and it was like I'm like, I was like a vessel for all this like stuff to just like pour through. And um, that's when I really started understanding what trauma was. And on a physical level, like I was literally physically like purging and clearing out all of these energies. And after I would clear them out, the medicine would fill me up with light and also all this beautiful wisdom. So it's like, not like it was just like going into this hard, dark stuff, but also like receiving a lot of beautiful insight. And so, you know, really diving deep into these like belief systems and like seeing even more and more layers. And um, what, what started unfolding for me was like, my work started becoming, feeling kind of empty. And this is about like a decade ago from now, <clears throat> eight years or something. And I started to feel like, not fulfilled, even though it was successful. I was good at what I was doing, fashion and whatever, but in performance. And I was like, it just wasn't filling my soul. And it was like one day I was just at my house and I was like kind of going through a funk. And so I just went outside and there was no music or anything. I just went outside. It was kind of twilight. And I just started stretching and doing some yoga, which led into some dance. The next thing you know, I just was taken, you know, like just by the spirit, right? And all of a sudden I like, I'm in flow state, full on flow state, which is, that's the thing that I was getting high on naturally from dance, right? It was like entering flow state through movement. And in that moment, it was like, I got that intuitive hit, like movement medicine. That's your medicine. That's the medicine that's help you heal you. Now learn how to share that. And I was like, ping, like, okay, I don't know where that came from, but that just, you know, all of a sudden was like in my head. And I was like, how do I share this? Like, how do I share movement medicine? Like, what does that mean? Like, I'm not a train, trained dancer. Like, how do I do that? And it was like, start with yoga. And I was like, okay, all right. And so I like immediately like found a teacher, the teachers that I was interested in, took a teacher training. And that was like a great beginning for me to learn how to articulate movement, right? And connecting breath. And it's like, it was one thing to do it. It's another thing to teach it. And so I, you know, again, yoga is a path of um, self looking, you know, inward and being in the present moment and mindfulness. And so that was a, that was a great door opener. And mm -hmm. so I stepped down through that door and then stepping in that door started opening other doors. Next thing you know, I have people asking me to teach, you know, dance classes and twerk and all this stuff. So I ended up um, doing that and simultaneously taking all these classes at the junior college and dance. And so I just dove in for a year, just studying all these dance forms and, um, you know, also, yeah, I studied belly dance for a number of years as well. And just, you know, started incorporating all this movement into, into dance, but not so much like such strict choreography, but really just getting people to move in their bodies and, and just seeing how that benefit was, um, was for people and as well as myself. Um, and so I did that, you know, simultaneously for a number of years, like teaching that um, yoga and dance stuff. And then um, always, so through this whole thing, since I was like 16, I've always worked out. Like I've always been a, a gym goer, someone that's always done fitness stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I trained people like that wanted to tra show up and do the work, like just what I know. I wasn't like professional, but at that point I was like, I think I'm going to get my, my personal training licensing too. Right. And so it was just like one thing after the other, right. Next thing you know, I go and do training through the National Academy of Sports Medicine, become a trainer, um, excel to master trainer. I'm training people now. I'm like really understanding more about fitness. Um, I went and got a behavior change specialization, like learning how to um, become a health and wellness coach. Um, you know, now I'm like, it's just expanding, expanding. And I'm realizing like, I really like doing multiple things. Like I enjoy not doing the same exact thing every day. Like, I like teaching the class here and teaching, you know, uh, dance or doing yoga or whatever. Um, so through the fitness thing, interestingly enough, this is where the body work comes back in full circle from 2005. Now it's not that I didn't give a massage here and there to like say my husband or whoever, but it was like, all of a sudden I'm like working with clients and, and it's, it's natural sometimes to do a little bit of hands-on work. Right. And so I'm in the gym setting and I'm like doing hands-on work. And now some of the trainers I work with, and some of them are like competitive bodybuilders and stuff are like give me some work, come on, you know, and we're, now I'm working on them. And I'm like, again, this feedback is like, you're really good at this. 
why not just like, incorporate this too? I was like, yeah, I like really like doing body work. And I was like, it feels good and seems to be helping other people. Um, and so I slowly just started like, oh, okay, maybe I'll get this engine going again. And, um, you know, one thing led to another, next thing you know, like I'm back in the game, like back in body work and doing that. Um, <laughs> You've been around yeah. the world a few times. Inside oh, out. a few, exactly. <laughs> That's a trip. like um just um you remember the you remember you know T Eckhart Tolle right yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, that pain body situation it was just reminding me about your situation going like the uh, Eckhart Tolle has got this uh, thing uh, to put like a it's simple simpler I'm sure you know it because it's like great way of, of explaining a lot of detail in a short amount of time but it's like not like what just happened with that sentence but um. Uh, he says that the pain body will become so it's like anything else that's alive in your body. It wants to be fed as well. And it will do anything else it can do to feed itself until a point where it becomes basically uh, it becomes the, the personality of the host body it's in. Now, some of us are going are gonna to do really fine just as psychonauts going out and just having our own experience. Like I, I really think the most important thing is like number one set and setting and atten intention because I got, I definitely went through the ringer one of the times I had taken mushrooms, just like used to do. I was young and I just like <laughs> ate some because everybody was eating them. And next thing you know, I was like blasted and wide open. I, I couldn't even be around people. I had to go like hide under the covers in the bed. And it was very clear. The mushrooms were like, you had no intention. You didn't set the stage. Like now they just took me on this wild journey. It was like, it wasn't comfortable. It was very uncomfortable. I didn't like it. It was again, like a oh, bad trip, which was a good thing because I got to learn something. And what I learned from that experience was like, it's really important for me to have some clear intention, you know, with the medicine and respect, respect the medicine, have respect and set a nice container that feels safe, you know, like where I am and who I'm around is a hundred percent important to how my experience is going to unfold. Um, so what's happened to me over the years is I've just become more and more sensitive, you know, like it doesn't take very much to like pop the doors open, so to speak, where back, you know, when I was really young, it was like, I could just like keep taking substances and whatever. And it was like, woo, it's like, now it's like, I just, I need to look at it. And I'm like, whew, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> like microdosing is amazing. Just holding a mushroom, you get high. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I want to just kind of finish off. Like I, we sort of talking and I didn't quite finish like where I left off with like how I got to kind of wearing them now what I'm doing. And so um, the last thing I had said was that, you know, I started getting into fitness and that brought me back into the touch therapy and the manual therapy. Now, simultaneously during that last, like, you know, eight years or whatever, like when I started getting deeper into working with this medicine and, and quite regularly, like multiple times throughout the year working and started, you know, working with different um, maestras, maestros, like different male and female healers that were just like, powerhouse, amazing heart center people that are just carrying medicine with integrity. Um, I started doing like plant dietas in these traditions, right. And started to apprentice and through that experience, just learning more and receiving more healing as well as like starting to make these relationships with plant kingdom, which has just been amazing. And what happens is that work started to inform all the work I was doing. It's like, it's like all started informing my entire reality right mm -hmm. in a new way and so um just becoming more sensitive to energies more sensitive and just learning how more and more to just get out of the way and it's still something I'm working on you know but like for me when I step into a situation you know where I'm going to be doing any kind of hands-on work with people I, I always make a prayer to that I can be a good clear channel a good clear hollow bone for the medicine to move through right and so like all the, the allies and teachers and energetic, you know, beings, all that intelligence from myself and the person I'm working with in our field to come through, right? And so the more I can get my ego and self out of the way, and again, it's not easy for me, like I'm, I get really attached to like being me. <laughs> but yeah. the more when I slip into that space, and I can get out of the way, then it's like, I just let like, I have the tools already in my brain. It's like, I know how to drive the car, I know how to do all the work, like the touch therapy, I understand all that. So the more I get out of the way, and allow like spirit to move me, then I can, um, then I feel like that there's even more benefit in those um, sessions, right? And like things happen. I'm like, it's not me. It's just what happens together, right? Energetically when myself and a client, if they're comfortable and I'm comfortable, we're comfortable together, we open up the field and like things are moving around and it becomes a really beautiful experience. Um, 
so yeah, like that work I continue to do to this day. Now also um, through the work of ayahuasca is when I got turned on to Dr. Gabor Mate. He's a total brilliant human being. Um, he lives in Canada, originally from Budapest. Um, he, he's been working deeply with the medicine, with the boga and um, ayahuasca and specializes with addiction. He was a palliative care doctor, a family physician for 50 years. And then he worked with the, it, it, the in Vancouver um, at, the, at a clinic there um, in like the hardest, most drug populated area. And through his work with the medicine and just through him being him and all of his life experience and his medical experience, he started just developing this way of communicating with people and working with people and working with trauma. And it's a very somatic approach, but it's called compassionate inquiry. And um, I started reading his books and getting really turned on to his work and listening to his lectures. And, um, you know, and I was really feeling the call. I was like, I'm, I really feel like I want to step into like coaching work or therapy or something. And I was like, well, man, I really didn't do a whole lot of college. I just did a little dabbling um, and including even a course in psychology. But I was like, that's a long journey, right? To become a licensed therapist. So I was like, okay, well, in the short term, maybe I can like do coaching work, right? Because that's a, a shorter term um, academic, you know, uh, program. And then I can work on the long term. So I set a short term goal. Um, and when I did that, I started, I enrolled in this program with Gabor for, and, and started doing this work with him and this team of people, this, these colleagues from all over the entire world of all demographics of all kinds of backgrounds from psychotherapists, to doctors, breath work, teachers, you know, you name it. And, and, and age groups from like around my age to, you know, um, much older. And it was just such a great experience to work in these diets and triads. Um, as a, an observer, as a therapist, and as a client. And we just did such deep work with like this. This work was the thing for me. It was like the places with the medicine that I just like, I hit some walls where I was like, I'm not able to break through these certain areas with the medicine. I was like, getting a little frustrated. I was like, it's not, the medicine isn't like doing the trick. It was this work. This is the work that helped me to integrate all the years of psychedelic use. It was like, oh my God, this totally makes sense. It was like this beautiful unwinding this process of like actually learning how to call all those parts of myself in and what was happening as I was getting kind of caught in rejecting parts of myself and this this kind of touches on what you said a moment ago about like you know these these parts of ourselves that like maybe we don't love that we like push away right or that we're not proud of or ashamed of is like or whatever calling that part in right because you can't get rid of yourself right so it's like how do we call all those parts of ourselves into our space right and create space for all of the parts of ourselves and just compassion and forgiveness that's the way forward that's the way through all of the stuff and so you know upon doing that work I became a licensed compassion inquiry practitioner and started bringing that work into the work I do with people and that became the foundation of the holistic health and wellness coaching I do and, um, and it's just amazing amazing work um, and simultaneously I did enroll in school so I am in school working on my psychology degree as well um, and, and we'll see where all that goes, you know, someday. Um, I do have an interest in working with psychedelics and possibly, you know, in the legal, uh, you know, therapeutic setting, you know, we'll see where that all goes, but, um, but it feels good. And I, you know, the thing I would want to share with people is like, you know, it's, everyone's path looks different. You know, like mine wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to take these steps. I'm going to get to this place. I'm going to do this one thing. It's like, you can see when you hear the story, like this full circle, like I've been gathering tools and putting them in my tool belt for 20 years. You know, I didn't just arrive here. And, and part of the reason, like I, like I said, like I opened the door and, into working with people with addiction is I feel addiction in myself. I know what addiction is like. I've been there. I've been an addict. I've also healed addiction. And so I feel an attraction to work with that population because I've been there. Like, I understand that. And I've alchemized that pain and those pains into my medicine and part of what I'm able to serve. And so when I work with people, like I show up as a clear mirror, right? And just as a, someone that's like walking side by side with the people I'm working with and continue to reflect back their true nature, right? Like not their stories, not their perceptions, not their all their stories of whatever trauma, abandonment, whatever, but really like their true self. So getting them to question their beliefs really gets, a, you know, question like what's actually true 
and starting to really talk about rewiring the brain, right? Because neurons that fire together, wire together. And if we're hardwired for all this like negative thought patterns and intrusive thoughts and um, negative events that are happening, like you said, we're just gonna keep re-manifesting this trauma network, right? Just keep reinforcing, that external reality keeps reinforcing it. Well, in the same way we can actually change that pattern and create something more beneficial and positive. And so, um, you know, how do we do that, right? It's a, it's a practice just like anything, right? So if you want your biceps to get strong, you got to like do curls, right? You got to do exercises mm -hmm. to strengthen it. It's the same thing with the mind, right? Like if we want to like get the mind to, um, you know, have more positive thoughts and like not just get caught up in, you know, negative thinking and self-limiting beliefs, then we have to train the mind. And so um, that's, that's pretty much, you know, it's the core of, of what I do with people and just help people get more connected to their true, true self, you know, without all the layers of, um, limiting, you know, beliefs and stuff like that. Yeah. That's, uh, getting rid of that ego is the biggest part. That's, uh, the one that seems uh, I found that people have the most trouble in doing is getting that, that ego, get rid of that. I don't really actually look at it like that. So yeah. I really, so again, that's like a rejection. I feel like that approach, like I'm not, cause you need to be here to function. Right. So it's like, how do we integrate the ego? Right. Like, so like the e what is the ego? What even is that, right? It's like the personality, right? Like what's beyond the ego is just a, a field of awareness, right? Like at our true, true core is a field of awareness, right? But we have to identify in life, like right? you have to be Brett to function and do your Brett with friends show here, right? So it's like, but also like, I think that it is an interesting dance and a balance of like, not, you know, like being attached to, that right but yeah. like allowing there to be space for um you know observing that aspect of our beingness without um rejecting it again you know it's so like i've moved away from the theories of of rejecting you know like yeah even even this experience you know like of humaning you know like i i remember like at some point being like i just want to send out of this whole reality it's like now like now i'm here like it's cool like i'm not trying to escape anything i'm like i'm i'm here I'm embodied. I'm in the present moment. Life weird as can be. It's a total mystery. I actually don't have the answers, but I'm totally excited to explore, you know, all the possibilities. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, um, I was going to ask you when you're on any of your, like I had a, have you ever did any uh, encounters with any um, uh, multidimensional life be uh, for, uh, beings? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, that, uh, have you ever seen it's kind of it's kind of a funny looking thing but it's like um this one eyeball looking creature with a uh, legs and uh like uh hinges it's um it's a multi-dimensional creature i'm trying to describe because it, okay. it was very, you got a picture? very unusual <laughs> uh, it had a ball for an eye and two legs okay. and it had these uh these square uh see-through wings that would wow. shudder and they would move across like this it was cool. like, no, I haven't. But they're um, they're really interesting. I have encountered I, I at a deep when you go deep, 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 um, and I saw them and they're kind of cracking me up because you don't quite can't figure out what they are at first. But then they uh, but the square the wings were square and they would shudder by you know they would flicker like a you know when it flickers, um, they would move like in that sort of uh, atmosphere. Uh, so, but I mean, uh, yeah, super you, cool. I wish I would see them. <laughs> no, maybe, I would see those maybe, ones. <laughs> maybe your next trip, they'll come, they'll come and say hi. Um, that'd be cool. Thanks. <laughs> have you ever, um, have you ever, do you know about the Dogon tribe? I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not like an expert on it, but I do know a bit about them. Can you tell me what you might, would you be, uh, willing to like, talk about, do, uh, what you do know about do, uh, Dogon or star, star, yeah. dog star? I mean, the only thing I really know is that they, the, in their uh, cosmology, that they're from Sirius. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if it's A or B, but they're from that star system. That's the, their lineage is from there. I don't actually really know like a lot, any details about, you know, what their history is or how they actually supposedly got here. Yeah, I think it's, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of different experiences with Dogon tribes, uh, with, okay. uh, on psychedelics, but in a dream state where uh -huh. I had a Anyways, maybe that's for a different thing, but uh, the Dogon tribes are uh, very, very tall, 
uh, uh, very, very dark skin, uh, black skin, uh, very, very, um, and they're part of the Ascension, I, from what I know about um, the Mayan Ascension and uh, the Maori, uh, there's a, near the Maoris are part of that group that they, you know, it's a multidimensional, uh, I think that we're living in multidimensional realities, really. I agree but with that, yeah. That I'm saying that's is so that far, that's been my experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, what do you have coming up that you want to talk about real quick in these next last minutes, and then, you know, um, maybe tell people how they can get a hold of you or find you for, for work or, uh, or Instagram, face Instagram. I don't know. Okay. Whatever the there's so many <laughs> platforms right now. Yeah. So okay. So what I have brewing is um, I've actually I wrote a manual this year, um, which is going to be available coming up soon, and it's a self inquiry manual. So it's um, going to be something that you can order and actually like just do this deep dive. And it's got it's like pretty much like a, a coaching manual that I developed for people to do on their own. Um, and with it comes a lot of practices of like meditation, breath work, uh, ritual, um, and all kinds of other stuff. So that's coming soon that'll be available through um, my website um, currently you know I'm seeing clients uh, via zoom conferences um, and depending on like whatever same place orders are happening or not in, in my area and I'm in Sonoma County California um, I have an in-person um, venue the healing sanctuary it's called and that's in downtown Santa Rosa so I do see clients there um, I can be most best is just to follow my Instagram, which is my name, Tristan Saint Germain. That's a great way to connect with me. Um, I don't really do the Facebook thing as much. So Instagram is definitely great. Um, and I just try to, you know, share stuff here and there regularly. Um, also it, it, my website, I did not launch, um, like my personal one yet, but I, I'm on one through the compassionate inquiry, um, organization. I'm one of the few, practitioners in this in the state um in california in particular and so i have a whole my whole i have a whole web page with them so that's just what i i have that on my instagram so i have a link tree when you go to my instagram in my bio all my connect stuff is through there what's so your you instagram get, page? Like, like, did you just tell them the my name? name have you ever thought about doing a podcast uh actually i was going to start one um and then i got coronavirus back in july oh, and i got sick yeah that happened. And I was like isolated and sick for like, you know, almost two weeks. And um, that was a whole journey. And, you know, during that time is when I actually wrote the manual, which is really interesting. Like I was like, you know, once I was the first four days sucked, like I couldn't move and I was in a lot of pain, but I did IV therapy. So I got like IV injections of like all kinds of vitamins and minerals and that like <laughs> brought me back to life. That was amazing. Um, if you can find a naturopathic doctor to help you do that, that's really great. Um, that's a big deal. And then, you got over What's coronavirus. That? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think if you're a healthy person, right, and you're not, you know, the thing is, is like if you have like lack of vitamin D in your system or you're carrying a lot of extra weight, these things, or you have autoimmunes, like these things are going to make it harder to heal for a lot of people. Um, I'm a really healthy person. So, you know, I was surprised I got it. I was like the first one of everybody I know, but I, and I did get sick and I also got better. I was like, hmm, okay. Um, it, you know, for me, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was like getting a really bad flu. Uh, now I know that I'm not saying that's that I'm not trying to downplay it by saying that I'm just telling you my experience, you know, and again, like I'm a healthy person. I know it's not the case for everybody. There's healthy people that are getting very sick. Um, but I also went like hardcore arsenal naturopathic remedy. Like I said, day two, I went and got IV for two hours. I sat there getting my, my blood pumped with glutathione, high doses of vitamin C, D3, magnesium, I mean, you name it, it was the whole Myers cocktail, right? And then I was using a nebulizer, which is a, basically a, a device to transport um, mist or whatever liquid medicine you can put in it into your lungs. I did that twice a day with glutathione. Glutathione is naturally occurring in your uh, lungs and your liver, and it's an antioxidant. It's like the mother of all antioxidants. It helped me to clear out my lungs because I was getting a lot of that lung congestion that comes with the coronavirus. And so um, I feel like I took steps and approaches that if I hadn't, I can't say what would have happened for me. And I just actually wish that these kind of remedies were more available to people. Um, you know, like here's the thing is like if your digestive system isn't functioning optimally and you're not uptaking nutrients, putting vitamins directly in your blood system just floods your body immediately. That's the benefit of that right? Not everybody's digestive system is, is running smooth. So you can eat all the vitamins you want. How much are you actually absorbing, right? 
So I, um, you know, for me, that was really good. Like I said, I went from full headache, lethargy, body pain to feeling like, oh, actually I feel okay. Like I still had a nasty cough, but like all that pain went away within an hour of the IV therapy. Now the problem is, I mean, this lady that I worked with, this doctor set me up an outdoor clinic, not inside, um, completely separate from anywhere else. Um, anybody else. And, um, you know, I think the thing is, is that that's going to be hard to find because unless a, per, a doctor or a standard public doctor has a, a clinic for coronavirus patients, then they will not work with you. So that's the challenge with that. It's like, it's like, oh, it's like, we, that'd be really great if we could use that and help people with that. Um, however, the lack of availability um, is a problem for people. Is so, a uh, vaccine or vaccine or no vaccine? Will you take the vaccine? Yeah, the coronavirus. Well, coronavirus at the vaccine. moment, not right now because I have the antibodies, right? I, I have pretty much the same as the vaccine at the moment. So I'm as good as a vaccine. Like I got the sickness, I built the antibodies, I fought it. So I currently have the antibodies. Now, like with both of those vaccines, you're getting, uh, you're building the antibodies to the virus. Now we don't know how long those vaccines are gonna last and we don't know how long my antibodies are gonna last, but I guarantee they're right around the same time frame. Um, we'll see, I'm not saying like, I'm not, I want the vaccine to be out for a while. I'm not rushing to go take any vaccines that have not been out for a couple of years so we can watch, you know, what happens with them. I'm not against the vaccines, but I'm also not like rushing to go get one because again, yeah. I, I've got the antibodies. Yeah, you, yeah, you're, you're, At least for now, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, I'm not getting it again anytime soon. And if I do, I'll, I'll fight it. Like, you know, that's just the thing. Like, again, I don't feel high risk um, even though I've gone through it. So that's, that's my take. Um, and the reason you asked me was about the podcast. So what happened was coming out of coronavirus, uh, that was July into August. And I was doing all the work, kind of getting everything set up. I had the podcast equipment set up in my trailer. I had this like beautiful, like uh, fifth wheel. And then September 28th, my house burned down in the, gra the glass fire. Everything gone. My trailer, the podcast equipment. I mean, I escaped that with my computer, my laptop, but I lost everything. Like, everything and so yeah. you know upon losing everything it was just like it was, it's almost like just getting like exploded out of your reality and like floating in space like completely ungrounded of like where am I where's anything what's anything where am I supposed to be that was like my life for like the last two months until recently um, <laughs> I mean I even left the state I, I was in not I, I moved nine times in two months okay with a family of two children that are in virtual school and two dogs I mean, nothing's more ungrounding than that. So any idea of podcasting, I like, went to the side, you know, it's like, yeah. this is not important right now. Now coming back around, you know, to like being grounded and like reestablishing, I, once I land back here in this month, I literally closed my last business where the healing sanctuary was because my partner, who was my brother, who had a bigger part of our studios moved to Florida and I moved into a new space, which is becoming this wellness collective. So I literally just um, finished my space last week. And so that's been my focus. And now coming back around, like, I love the idea of podcasting. I love having conversations with people. Um, I mean, this particular conversation, I, I did a lot of talking, but I like, you know, going Q&A and like diving no, no, into this stuff. Is great. And, I, I've, been, I've, yeah. I've been absorbing it all. It's all, this is yeah, all yeah. <laughs> information. Yeah, it's great. And I feel like I have access to a lot of amazing people that like we, and I, I'm already having amazing conversations all the time. So I'm like, yeah, like, let's do more of this. But it's a whole thing and it takes some commitment and right now like my main commitment is um obviously like taking care of home and family um uh, uh, my business and work to you know as much as I can do there and I'm doing school I'm working on my psych degree and that's like that's a full plate right there so I'm like do I have time if I had a team and I could just show up and do these like this and someone else is going to edit it and and deal with the like the logistics side of it and the sound quality and all that I probably would do it but it's like I can't do all that back work myself right now like I I love, I could show up and do the interviews and like schedule them, but that's probably about like my capacity because again, like I had to, you know, get really clear, like, where do I have the, what do I have the energy to think into? And for me to run my life, everything goes on a calendar. That's how yeah. I operate. If it's not on a calendar, it's not happening. I have to schedule my workouts. You know what? I don't but, put it on. Right, I know. Okay. you got a lot of plates spinning. We're going to wrap it up here soon. <laughs> but I definitely think that you should just at least do one. And um, oh. and uh, you'll learn more in that one thing uh, than um, than an hour of YouTube explanatory videos. Um, okay. But um, I can see you doing because you like you what you just basically said. I mean, 
uh, you have a lot of people that you know that can talk about a lot of good stuff or something similar to what you just said. But, um, and, um, and uh, it's, it might, you might be killing two birds with one stone. If you, if you do a podcast, I think you'll get a, I could see you completely wrapping it around because just, if you have other people that are like-minded that you, I mean, you can bring like a, be like a, a, a beacon to that, uh, industry like uh, I mean everyone's got their own podcast now so it's super simple to do if you got an iMovie on your on your computer or editing thing it's super simple but it's about the conversation I mean I sometimes joke that I did this because uh, I have the time I want to do it for a few years but now we all have time but I wasn't being social and I and so this is I made this podcast so I could talk to my friends and I, was like, <laughs> I love it <laughs> but when I was thinking about it I was like breast with friends breast with friends I was like Wait, but who am I, who could I possibly invite on the show? And I was like, everybody. I was like, I know, <laughs> I know, I know so many talented, creative people like yourself that have all these things. And uh, this, it becomes very addicting. This podcast because I, you know, every it's very addicting. <laughs> this podcast because you want, like, you're my twenty fourth um, guest on Brett's awesome. with Friends. And very cool. That's all happened in about the course of two months. Oh wow. So you're, you're recording a lot. But, you know, I've, it was, it's, I like the messiness of the learning and uh, it was, uh, it was very fun. And I'm trying to get out of my own way sometimes because I find it more entertaining when other people talk and I just watch and listen to what they say. Um, okay. <laughs> are you, where there. are you putting this out there, by the way? Like, uh, YouTube. Um, okay. Uh, Instagram. Um brettwoods.com at some point okay. i'm going to link it with my website but youtube's yeah, the best, you know uh, the best way to do it but um you know i too want to get off facebook as well and but it's a i don't know we have i i, I think it's all gelling into this coalescing in this interesting way we gotta <laughs> write it but yeah. it, i swear you should do one i i bet you do really have a lot of fun well, you're definitely inspiring me. That's for sure. It's always something that's been like on, you know, it's like not always, but for the past couple of years, it's been something I've talked about a lot. And I even, I even created a uh, logo for my podcast. I even oh, made an album oh. cover. Yeah. I was like, I was like, like I said, but right now I don't even have the equipment anymore. So like do, a half hour, do one half hour show. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't, yeah. <laughs> one half, well, once we get going, going, it's like a 30 minute like, show. Like, invite your, invite your, one of your friends and, just try it out, even if you, but you'll love it. I mean, it's very okay. funny, especially if you put your logo on there. Anyways, yeah. we're going to wrap it up. We got to go. This Yay. has been St. Germain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, let's, Brett and friends. Try, let's uh, try to do this again in the future. And uh, yeah, happy new sure. year. I think you might be my my last guest of the year. Whoop, whoop. Awesome. Whoop. Well, goodbye, 2020. Fuck off. So ready. For 2021. <laughs> all right. See great. you. Well, thank you so much. Really good to talk to you. That was great. I had so much fun. I really enjoyed the heck out of that thing. We'll I talk learned more about like multidimensional beings and aliens next time. <laughs> we'll do a part two. We'll do a part two. There's a whole Dogon okay. tribe thing happening. Okay. Be all well. Right. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Tell everybody love to your family. Be well. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, that was Tristan St. Germain. Check her out. Pence Fly Hat. Yes, I'm still peddling these damn things. I got hats to sell. Penceflyhat.com. Anyways, my name is Brett Woods. Go check out my website, brettwoods.com. That was Tristan St. Germain. That was a very great conversation. Cheers. Here's the 2021.